Hi, I'm Phil Hill, and welcome to eLiterate TV. At Arizona State University, we saw an institution that often leads change from the top down, following the lead of its president or the executives at ASU Online. Today, we're going to look at another large research university, the University of California at Davis, that is also trying to drive change within undergraduate education, but this time from a very different campus culture. UC Davis has the third largest enrollment of any of the schools in the University of California system after UCLA and UC Berkeley. They have a strong emphasis in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, fields. Before jumping into the specific changes, we should start by understanding what problem UC Davis is trying to solve. So my role here at the university is to make sure that we optimize student success, specifically looking at all the academic opportunities that students have at this university. I then want to make sure that their initial courses, their introductions, which are taught in these very large formats, are as successful as possible, both in terms of the capacity of getting students into the classes, making sure that they're able to learn what they need to learn and they have the foundational knowledge to go forward. So with these large format classes, are we talking about freshman and sophomore lower level classes? We're primarily talking about freshman and sophomore. We're talking about situations where students are three to 600 students in a class. We're talking about introductory classes where a total of 2,500 students might be taking that course in a given quarter in five different, four to five different classes traditionally with four or five different instructors. So that's one of the unique challenges of UC Davis. Is that just in terms of that's the nature of our classes or have you actually detected, you know, we have a, we need to make improvements in learning within this type of class? So we know by looking at the data that the vast majority of our students are actually disappearing or leaving uh, in the first two years. Uh, and let me clarify, by vast majority I mean that of the 18 to 20 percent of students that leave our university, uh, fully 90 percent of those students have left by the end of their second year. Based on that information, we've decided that we need to pay particular attention to what courses they're involved with in those first two years. And when you do a careful analysis of the classes that they actually have to take, you realize that they're primarily taught in these very large formats. So given that, now let's sort of talk about the what. So what are the programs that you've put in place or that you're experimenting with right now? So we specifically worked in biology and chemistry, uh, primarily because that's where the vast majority of our introductory students start. And uh, many of our students will be taking in the same year in their first year introductory chemistry, what we call 2A, and introductory biology, also 2A, chemistry versus biology. Uh, in those areas, we have focused on looking at the whole system of instruction, uh, which ranges from what we offer students in, the, uh, in their off-class classroom times, like their homework times and study times, what we do with students during their discussion time with teaching assistants, and what we do in the actual classroom. <clears throat> looking at that span, we've tried to figure out how to optimize the time spent in each of those three areas. Sure. So this series, we're actually looking at personalized learning, which a lot of people use the term, but there's not a lot of information about what does it mean. But let me just start out, do you even use that term here on this campus? No, we, we never use the term personalized learning. I think if I were to say that to people, they'd think that would be something that they go away from here and they maybe do an online MOOC or something else. Uh, we talk about maximizing the learning experience with the resources that we have available. And we really think about that first and then apply technology where appropriate to get that maximal benefit for the students. So it sounds to me like you have common learning design principles yeah. that are being implemented, but they get implemented in different ways. So you have common things of making students accountable, having the classes much more interactive where students have to react and try to apply what they're learning. Yeah, the main general principle here is we're trying to get, if you want to learn something complex, which is what we try to do at an R1 university, um, that takes a lot of practice and feedback. Mm -hmm. um, until recently, much of that was supposed to be going on at home with homework or, or whatnot, but it's difficult to get feedback at home when the smart people aren't there that would help you, either your peers or your 
professor. So that's the whole idea of the flipped classroom where come prepared with some basic understanding and take that time where you're all together to do the high quality practice and, and get the feedback while we're all together. And so everything that we're doing is focused on that sort of principle, getting that principle into the classroom. Several years ago, the IM STEM group started working with the biology and chemistry departments to apply some of these learning concepts in an iterative fashion. So my hopefully permanent assignment now, at least for the next five years, will be um, what we call BIS 2A, which is the first introductory course of biology here at UC Davis. Um, it's part of a series, um, and its primary goal is, is to teach fundamentals of cellular and molecular biology going from origins up to the formation of a cell. So we teach all the fundamentals in this class, um, the stuff that's used for, for futrons. And about three or four years ago, we actually, I got involved in this class to sort of help redesign it, come up with a stronger curriculum, um, and primarily bring in sort of hands-on interactive learning techniques. Um, and we've done a bunch of experiments and changed the course in a variety of ways, and it's still evolving um, over the last several years. Um, the biggest thing that we did was add a discussion section, which is two hours long, where, they, where we've done a lot of our piloting for this interactive online um, personalized learning uh, is the new, do uh, new way of saying things, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, last quarter in the fall, was the first time we really tried to quote, flip part of the classroom, that is, make the students take a little bit more responsibility for their own reading and learning, and then the classroom, classic lecture, is more asking questions, trying to get them to put A and B together to come up with C. And it's sort of that process that we'd like to emphasize and get them to actually learn, and that's what we want to test them on, not so much the facts, and that's the biggest challenge. All right, so now that you've gone through this, and how long has it been since you've actually had the new format, including what the main classroom changes have been? The main classroom changes uh, since January. Okay, oh, okay, so very yeah. recent. Yeah, so the last time I taught it was, uh, was right before we started doing these kind of um, changes in terms of interaction. Uh, so I, like I said, two years ago I taught straight lecture. Yep. And. Uh, same way I taught it, you know, 20 years, for the past 20 years. Yeah. So uh, the discussion sections had changed, and that gave us a coherence, you know, as, like I said, a cohesiveness across the, um, the instructors. But at the same time, we weren't feeling like the students were getting the knowledge that we wanted. One of the things that um, I like about the new format is I can probe the students on the spot. You know, um, in my lecture today, for example, I got a question and because my students by this point in the quarter are so used to being interactive that they can talk, they can interrupt, um, we try to make it a positive environment so that if they answer a question incorrectly, we try to support that. And I can find out that there is something that I was assuming that they would know in my lecture and it was like, oh, I think we're going to have to stop for a minute because there's this major under misunderstanding. Whereas in the old lecture format, it was very hard to draw that out. Mm -hmm. And so I think being able to get them used to talking a lot, they're more willing to tell us what they know and what they don't. At UC Davis, we're seeing faculty work side by side with staff to redesign the large lecture classes with the goals of increasing conceptual understanding and improving retention. All of these changes are meant to address a major bottleneck in the STEM pipeline. A cliche is that distance education begins in the fifth row, but UC Davis is making significant efforts to change this situation. In the next episode, we'll take a deeper look at intro to chemistry and intro to biology to see how faculty members and even teaching assistants are taking a more personalized approach.